Clean Hands Save Lives. Written by Thierry Couset. Narrated by Jeff Burt. Chapter 5. An Economy of Peace. Part 1. In January 2006, accompanied by Sir Liam Donaldson, Didier made his first trip to Africa as a World Health Organization delegate. Leaving Geneva helped take his mind off his problems. He'd spent the holiday season brooding about his personal situation, while Brigitte moved into an apartment nearby. His life was going to pieces. By devoting himself to the welfare of others, he'd neglected to look after himself. He felt devastated. Severina comforted him with her text messages. Together they had organized the launch ceremony at the WHO. She draped two immense banners down the ten floors of the hospital's facade. She did a tremendous public relations job for us. When he arrived in her office, she asked him if he was feeling all right. Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Not really. My wife just left me. The text messages kept alive this relationship that had not yet gained enough strength to awaken Didier's enthusiasm. In the meantime, he clung to his calling even though it had already caused him to neglect his marriage and family. Rather than change his ways, he preferred to fight fire with fire, vaccinating himself with his work. Together with Donaldson, they were driving back to Nairobi after visiting three Kenyan hospitals. They were two hours ahead of their schedule. Didier did not relish the thought of spending them alone in his hotel room. How about making another visit? Donaldson agreed, and their driver took them to the Kijabi Hospital. Working for the WHO is great. Even unannounced, we're welcome everywhere we go. And in this case, once again, there was another extraordinary turn of events. We went into a room, and right away I saw, on a wooden stand under padlock, an alcohol dispenser. In 2006, the hand hygiene program had been announced but was not yet being implemented. The WHO was still selecting pilot sites. They needed to be followed closely, and then recommendations based on their experiences would be written up, which would help hospitals all over the world to develop their own programs. That day was still far off. Didier was astonished to discover an alcohol-based hand rub dispenser in a Kenyan hospital room where he turned up by mere chance. He asked the nurse on duty when she used the alcohol and was delighted to learn that she knew at least some of the five key moments for hand hygiene. But the presence of the padlock bothered him. The alcohol should be readily available. Any hindrance would only limit compliance. How much do you pay per bottle, asked Didier, thinking that only expensive products would be placed under lock and key. The nurse didn't know the price and referred him to the hospital director. On the way, Didier ran into Peter Nthumba, the hospital's chief surgeon, who had trained in Britain and returned there every three years for an update. On these visits, Peter would meet with former colleagues and they would take him to the operating room to show him the latest techniques. In 2003, the British campaign for hand hygiene was underway and Peter discovered the use of the alcohol-based hand rub. Upon returning to Kenya, he'd asked his director to buy some bottles. Well, that explains the presence of alcohol where I wasn't yet expecting to find it, Didier noted with satisfaction. He congratulated the surgeon and then the director. And how much do you pay for these bottles? The director consulted the accounts and finally announced the price. But that's scandalous, Didier said angrily. That's terrible. The Kenyans were paying three or four times more for the alcohol than in Europe or the United States. When he left the hospital, Didier exploded. The pharmaceutical companies are messing with us. He'd been on bad terms with them ever since his article in The Lancet, criticizing the gels they were distributing in Britain. The price shouldn't be an obstacle for hand hygiene. If a preventive measure is costly, it won't work. The hand rub has to be as cheap as possible. The conclusion was obvious. They should produce it locally. That's a good idea, Donaldson assured him. We'll call it the WHO formulation for hand hygiene and publish it everywhere. We'll break their stranglehold over the market. Then they won't be able to make profits at the patient's expense. Chapter 5, Part 2 It was Didier's third big intuition. After realizing that soap and water weren't working, and that only a multimodal approach would bring about change, 
He decided he needed to give the world the hand rub formula and its five-point use protocol for free. Didier is a born humanitarian, says Donaldson. He would never have accepted seeing the poor treated without proper hygiene. After concocting the simplest and least expensive formulation possible, including one variant with ethanol and another with isopropanol, he established a WHO team which included, among others, Shashi Dharan, a microbiologist from the hospital at the University of Geneva, Manfred Roter, an expert in testing alcohol-based solutions, Syed Shatar, a specialist on their efficacy with respect to viruses, and of course the indispensable William Griffiths. For William, it wasn't always easy, Didier observes. It was as if we'd torn his child from him. Every time we suggested a change for practical reasons or cost, he had trouble accepting it. He was defending the ideal position of a chemist, while we were seeking to create a universal formula. But once again, his role was decisive. Industrial alcohol isn't necessarily pure. Griffiths came up with the idea of auto-sterilizing it by adding hydrogen peroxide. That allowed any spores present to be killed. In the end, the WHO team proposed two formulations along with a production manual. The first was composed of 80% ethanol, 1.45% glycerol to protect the hands, and 0.124% hydrogen peroxide with the rest made up of water. In the second, Ethanol was replaced by isopropanol dosed at 75%. Any less isopropanol or ethanol, as one sometimes find in general use products sold in pharmacies or supermarkets, and the formulation is not as effective or even useless. Although both these recipes proposed by the WHO conform with European Union standard EN 1500, they are in theory less effective than other more expensive formulations, such as the one originally perfected by Griffiths for the hospital at the University of Geneva, which included chlorhexidine, a patented product. Nevertheless, they are highly reliable, and the WHO strongly encourages their adoption for at least five reasons. One, they have a wide spectrum of action, and very few microbial agents resist them. Two, they are ideal for areas without sinks or access to clean water. 3. They increase compliance with hand hygiene by making the operation quicker and more practical. 4. Their cost does not exceed 1% of that entailed by lower compliance with hand hygiene. In most countries, a 100 milliliter bottle can be produced locally for less than half a U.S. dollar. And 5. They minimize the risks of secondary effects due to the high level of skin tolerability. I prefer to use the WHO formulations, confides Marie-Noël Schreti. I find that they are less aggressive on the hands. On each of his trips abroad, Didier explains how pharmacists can make the new formulations locally for almost nothing. The key is the alcohol, which can be distilled from a large variety of plants. In Africa, it can be derived from nuts, maize, manioc, or sugarcane husks. Elsewhere, potatoes or beets can be used. Foreign pharmacists have started coming to the University of Geneva for training, such as Lozani Bengali from the Point G Hospital in Bamako, Mali. Then they go home to launch their production chains and train their colleagues. The pharmaceutical companies hated me. He's appalled by their greed, their blindness as juridical entities to individual suffering, their antagonism toward the common good. The missionary has awoken within him. He wants to eliminate every obstacle that stands in the way of his great work. He understands that hand hygiene will only propagate itself if nothing hinders it, whether this be to religious belief or political and economic interests. The formula had to be made public and available to all, like Newton's laws of gravity or a mathematical theorem. It had to be made part of humanity's heritage without anyone being able to place it under an embargo the general interest had to prevail over special interests. Didier does not consider himself to be making a heroic gesture. He is simply a doctor doing what's best for the health of his patients. He forgets that in similar situations, many other researchers file patents in order to reap personal profit. Pharmacies are filled with their innovations, often unaffordable to most people. Didier does not think like them. He does not understand them. He doesn't even criticize them. Hand hygiene is something too simple, too necessary for it to be patented. The idea never even occurred to me. 
Yet, during his speech, he announced that if he took a tenth of a cent for every bottle of alcohol-based hand rub solution sold throughout the world, he would earn $1.7 billion per year. His boss at the Hospital of the University in Geneva promptly declared him the most expensive doctor on the planet due to the loss of revenue he cost them. The WHO had already made public the formula for rehydrating badly nourished infants, Didier explains. Before that, it cost a fortune. Now you just need a little cola, some sugar and salt, and everyone can make it. According to him, he's simply following the long line of humanitarians before him. It's impossible to make him see that alcohol-based hand rubs are destined for far more widespread use than the rehydration formula, that they're on a whole different scale. Meanwhile, William Griffiths pointed out that if the Cantonal Hospital of Freiburg had not released the original formula back in 1976, nothing would have come of it. The University of Geneva team was only able to improve upon it because it was free from the very start. Following on from that, at Didier's instigation, the World Health Organization has been pursuing the same policy. If the formula hadn't been free, Didier would have been held hostage by one pharmaceutical company or another. He would have been perhaps unable to meet the independence criteria demanded by the World Health Organization. He would have been accused of a conflict of interests, and the hand hygiene challenge never would have been launched. Chapter 5, Part 3 Without knowing it, Didier has joined a political movement born in the beginning of the 1980s and spearheaded by Richard Stallman. At the time, this 27-year-old computer programmer was working at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Its new central printer furnished by Xerox had an unwelcome tendency to jam up with paper. Annoyed, Stallman devised a way to modify the program managing the printer, not to prevent paper jams, which were caused by a purely mechanical problem, but to alert users whenever they occurred. The trouble with this was that Xerox had not supplied the printer's source code. It was a black box. When Stallman learned that an engineer at Carnegie Mellon possessed a copy of the code, he went to visit him. The conversation was brief. Stallman was denied access for legal reasons. The code was protected by copyright. Stallman felt betrayed. For years, ever since the pioneering days of computing, programmers had shared their creations, modifying them and then remixing them like bricks in a Lego game. More often than not, they didn't even bother to sign them. A program would develop the way a city develops, said Stallman nostalgically. Parts would get replaced and rebuilt. New things would get added on, but you could always look at a certain part and say, hmm, by the style, I see this part was written back in the early 1960s, and this part was written in the mid-1970s. This system of intellectual capitalization was finally shattered at the beginning of the 1980s. Commercial secrecy and the hunger for profits undermined the spirit of cooperation. Sam Williams eloquently sums up the situation. Like a peasant, whose centuries-old irrigation ditch had suddenly grown dry, Stallman had followed the ditch to its source only to find a brand spanking new hydroelectric dam bearing the Xerox logo. In Kenya, Didier discovered another kind of dam. Since the pharmaceutical companies imported the products in small quantities and were subjected to high customs duties, they were supplying alcohol-based hand rubs at prices that were far too high and ended up making a technically abundant resource scarce. It was my first encounter with a non-disclosure agreement, and it immediately taught me that non-disclosure agreements have victims, said Stallman. In this case, I was the victim. My lab and I were victims. Moral victims in the case of computer software with a protected code. Physical victims in the case of an essential pharmaceutical formulation. Ever since then, Stallman refuses to sign non-disclosure agreements. He makes his codes public instead of locking them up in a safe. In 1983, he founded the Free Software Foundation, an association with the goal of developing software whose source code would be free and form part of humanity's common heritage. The free culture movement was born. In a similar manner at the beginning of the 1990s, Tim Berners-Lee unleashed the World Wide Web, and Linus Torvalds gave us Linux, an operating system that works with most Internet servers. 
They gave no thought to enriching themselves, but instead they have enriched us collectively. It's often said that their generosity was only possible in the digital world, which is an immaterial world. Didier proves to us that such gestures can be applied to health and to the human domain. His work takes on its full meaning with the prospect of a profound economic change. At the end of the 1990s, members of the Free Software Foundation started to label free software as open source. In 2001, Creative Commons extended the idea to all works of the mind, whether they were technical, scientific, or artistic in nature. For a growing number of activists, it became obvious that there were two opposing strategies. Either creations would be liberated, or they would be protected by restrictive copyrights. Do I share my ideas, or do I privatize them? Innovators must now ask themselves. Do I develop them myself? Or do I permit all people of good will to develop them at the same time as me? In the old economy, these questions made no sense. When you had an idea, you couldn't really communicate it unless you made a big hit and became famous for earning billions by engaging successfully in economic warfare. Today, with communications technologies, we can transmit our ideas, our innovations, explaining them and accompanying them before even making a business out of them. Didier adopted this pacifist philosophy spurred by a moral necessity, the determination to defend patients at all costs from nosocomial infections. This higher imperative led to an immediate economic consequence. Since alcohol was abundant, it could not be privatized. For activists, the argument does not stop at this point. They generalize it. Nothing that is abundant can be privatized. Anything that can be given away without cost should be. This political stance should not be confused with communism. Following the Professor of Economics and Information Nick dyer Witherford at the University of Western Ontario, it's been called communism, in reference to common goods, or the commons. Communists are concerned with the harmonious management of common goods. They are both ecologists, worried about the use of rare resources, and open sourcers in the tradition of Stallman involved in sharing abundant resources. Communism is the ethics of sharing. That which is limited should be economized and shared by all as a common good. In the same way, that which is unlimited should be multiplied and shared by all as a common good. Didier is a communist in both senses. He's concerned with a rare common good, life, and with a potentially abundant good, essential medication. When he decided, during his visit to Kenya in 2006, that he would offer the formulation and the five-point multimodal approach to the WHO, Didier was not aware that he had discreetly entered the political arena. He was doing what seemed fair to him, but his gesture has contributed to a growing groundswell. The old culture of dam builders will be replaced by a gift culture, a culture based on an economy of peace. You no longer have any reason to come kill me in order to take what I've already given you. Until now, entrepreneurs have enriched themselves within the framework of the predatory economy, and then, like Bill Gates, they may become philanthropists. Today, new men and women are renouncing wealth altogether. They share the fruits of their labors as soon as the opportunity presents itself. They refuse war, even an economic one. Their pacifism is a precondition to any action they take. Offering humanity the formula for hand hygiene costs only the price of posting a page on the WHO's website. The gift culture develops alongside the information society. So it's very natural for the work of Didier Pité and his team to be linked with that of Richard Stallman. Yet this still isn't understood, despite everything. One morning, Stefan Harbarth burst excitedly into Didier's office. Look what I just found. They're trying to patent your brain. An American company wants to appropriate the five-point multimodal strategy. Didier was flabbergasted. He'd never paid much attention to the issue of patents. My nest, my home, is my hospital, my team. That's my family. And it's normal to share with it. For many people caught up in the predatory economy, such generosity is not self-evident. Accompanied by an armada of lawyers, they attempt to seize what has been given. It's disgusting. They won't get away with it. Our findings have been published by the World Health Organization, by The Lancet, 
and even by Wikipedia. But one can draw some ominous lessons about human nature from this episode. Today, Didier is more famous for the fortune he gave up than for the millions of lives he saves each year. Chapter 5, Part 4 At the end of 2006, Didier received a call from the British Embassy. I'm very moved, stammered a man whose voice Didier did not recognize. The Queen wants to make you a Knight of the Crown. Didier burst out laughing, thinking someone was playing a prank on him. I'm quite serious, continued the man who introduced himself as the British Ambassador to Switzerland. I'm calling you from Bern to find out if you will accept this honor. The procedure has been underway for a year. We already have agreement from the Swiss Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Internal Affairs. The ambassador's emotion was so intense that it deeply touched Didier, who was struck by the solemnity of the moment. He accepted the honor, of course. When he learned that two nobles had nominated him, he thought of Sir Liam Donaldson and perhaps Sir Ian Chalmers. He was stunned by the news, nevertheless. His friends all teased him. It's such a British thing, Irene, his younger daughter, exclaimed. Just like Paul McCartney, the old man from the Beatles. Better, Didier jokingly replied. In 1969, McCartney and the other Beatles were made MBEs, members of the Order of the British Empire. Whereas they're making me CBE, commander of the British Empire, a higher rank. The Queen officially named Didier a commander on January 1st, 2007. The ceremony took place in Geneva in the company of his family, his friends, and his closest collaborators. As Didier was about to leave, the ambassador whispered to him, You should have the medal insured by Lloyd's. It costs a lot of money. Upon your death, your family will have to return it. Once again, the ambassador seemed deeply moved, as if the entire weight of an age-old tradition rested upon his shoulders. Didier walked off to hide his own emotion. He thought of his sister, Ariane, absent that day, hospitalized due to cancer. When he returned to the hospital at the University of Geneva, he was greeted by cheers. Put the medal on! Put the medal on! He took the medal out of its box. A chubby Genevan grabbed it out of his hands and put it around his own neck. Take your pictures, guys, he shouted, strutting around. An Englishman who was a member of the infectious diseases team came up to him. He seemed so furious that the crowd fell silent. How dare you clown around like this? He turned to Didier. You shouldn't take this lightly. Didier had no desire to laugh. He was well aware of the honor that had just been bestowed upon him. For the British, this was something really important. He'd helped them set up the service for the prevention of infections at Hammersmith Hospital in 1999, and then offered them his advice during the launch of the National Campaign for Hand Hygiene in 2003. He had given the formula to the WHO in 2006, and he'd always turned down monetary rewards. But he could not refuse the recognition. In an economy of peace, respect is all that binds men together. The extravagance of the symbol matters little. I've never seen anything quite so horrid-looking, Ariana dared to comment when Didier went to see her in the hospital. Turquoise, gold, orange, red, what an awful combination of colors. Very gaunt and bald due to chemotherapy, her skin a shade between yellow and gray, Didier's sister found the strength to smile. The painter and art professor might not have liked the look of the medal, but she was proud of her big brother. In her heart, she knew that he'd received the only kind of reward that mattered to him. Like Richard Stallman, Didier does not refuse awards. As opposed to money, recognition and thanks have the property of being available in unlimited quantities. They are the currency of abundance, the currency that irrigates the economy of peace. Money, on the other hand, is scarce. It creates inequalities, separating the rich and the poor. It arouses greed that sometimes proves fatal. But honor can't be seized. It can only be earned by the giving of one's self. Of course, to be able to give, one needs to live in a protective ecosystem that satisfies basic needs. As a civil servant living in Geneva, Didier enjoys good financial security. Giving away the hand rub formulas and their use protocol has not placed him in a precarious position. An economy of peace can only thrive in a framework which promotes mutual aid. Richard Stallman and Linus Torvalds are researchers 
whose work is now sponsored by universities or nonprofit foundations. Tim Berners-Lee was employed by the European Nuclear Research Institute when developing the world's first website. Didier repeatedly says that he has always needed institutional backing, pointing out how, with its seal of approval alone, an intergovernmental agency like the WHO can lift mountains. Government is the system which allows individuals to satisfy their hunger, to house themselves, to have their illnesses treated, and to obtain an education. Government provides the minimal shell from which an economy of peace can emerge. Government must ensure the abundance of everything that can be abundant. Alcohol-based hand rubs, along with culture, information, along with freedom. On the other hand, when the government acts to protect the dam builders, those who limit abundance, it strays from its mission. Bankers prosper from the scarcity of money, politicians from the scarcity of power, energy producers from the scarcity of energy. An economy of peace will not be generalized until each of these bottlenecks is eliminated one by one. So government itself will be transformed. It will no longer be the place where power is exercised, but where all people of goodwill cooperate. Everybody comes out ahead, Didier says delightedly. The pharmaceutical companies ended up congratulating him too. They even set up their own association for patient safety called POPs under the umbrella of the WHO. The consumption of alcohol being used in hospitals continues to grow. They lowered their price, but their revenues are increasing. Even at the University of Geneva, we signed up with a pharmaceutical company. Our in-house pharmacy no longer has the time to produce the bottles we need. In 2012, we consumed 20 more times than in 1993 to 1994. But when an institution cannot find a suitable supply of alcohol-based hand rubs, it can synthesize its own. In Malaysia, three companies controlled the market. It isn't a country with a high cost of living. The products were not expensive, but they still involved costs. So the government decided to make them in a central pharmacy. The same choice was made in Hong Kong. Elsewhere, companies phoned us to ask permission to put on the marketing WHO alcohol-based hand rub for hand hygiene. It was a great victory over the market. By releasing the formula, Didier gave institutions the power to say, no, not at that price, not with that formulation. He increased the hospital's freedom with respect to the pharmaceutical corporations. No more patents, no more exclusive rights, the manna was shared equitably between all of the actors involved. Abundance has pacified a sector of the market to the greater benefit of the patients. It's an example that can be followed in other domains such as vaccinations or antibiotics.